Welcome to the second lecture in the Introduction to Game Programming 1D before 37 course. My name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck. Today we're going to talk about game architectures. So we have the game system overview, we have the hardware, and on the hardware the game engine is running. And on top of the game engine we have a game specific code and both two together make out the game. And we can use tools like Maya and Audacity to create. 3D models and sound effects and similar. The actual game, the game engine and the game specific code is a very complex piece of software and we need a way to structure it, structure the different classes we, we use in the system and this is what we call an architecture. So the low level design describes how classes are coupled and how they interact with each other and the game system is often so large and complex that we need to separate classes into modules. And module is a group of classes that handle a specific task in the game, for example a file system manager, a rendering system or similar. And modules can be part of a main source code or placed in static or dynamically linked libraries, DLLs in Windows. And in most programming languages you can separate classes into modules with a, the package system. In Java you use include, java.util for example, and in C-sharp you use system, using system.collections or similar. And there are different types of architectures we can use with their respective pros and cons. And the most common one, and the one which you're probably most familiar with even if you're not aware of it, is the ad hoc architecture. And it means that the architecture has no organization whatsoever. Classes are simply added when they are needed without looking at the big picture, looking at the overview of a system. And classes are not separated in different subsystems, which leads to a very tight coupling between different parts of the code. And using an ad hoc architecture is in almost all cases a bad design and it's only acceptable for very small projects. And a better approach is to use a modular architecture where specific subsystems are identified and separated into modules or libraries. And different modules can communicate with each other in different more or less coupled ways. And the titles coupling is when we use direct method calls from classes in one module to classes in another module. And the lowest coupling is when we have a public interface and communicate through message passing or indirect method calls. And we can have a mix or a blend of these two. And the module can then be replaced by a newer version if it uses the same public interface. So we can remove the file system manager we have, and put the new file system manager if we want to change file system in the game. Or we can replace an AI module if we want to introduce new behavior for characters, etc. And the drawback with a standard modular architecture is that dependencies between the different modules are not controlled. And over time modules tend to be more and more dependent on each other, leading to a very tightly coupled system. So we just place new models without thinking of a big picture. Uh, and even if we have a modular system, we have a lot of dependencies between the module instead of a lot of dependencies between different classes. And we still have a tightly coupled system, which is something we want to avoid. So we can build up on the modular architecture to make less coupled systems. And the next step is to use a directed acyclic graph or DAG architecture. And it's a modular architecture where dependencies between modules are controlled. And by controlling these dependencies, we avoid getting a very tightly coupled system. And we can visualize the modular architecture in a graph which models with models as node and dependencies as directed links. And if we do that in a DAG architecture, no loops are allowed in these graphs. And ideally we want the architecture to be wide and shallow to avoid long chains of dependencies. So an example of a DAG architecture is this, where we don't have any loops in the dependencies. So the different arrows just go down in the system. We don't create any loops where we go upwards. And we should also try to not have as m too many levels so we have a wide architecture. So compare this one with 
the standard module architecture and it's much more simple and much more controlled so we if we avoid all the loops it's much easier to replace a module with another module without causing any unforeseen problems. We can also build upon the DAG architecture to do a layered architecture and it's quite similar but in that no cycles in the graph are allowed. Are allowed. But the layered architecture organizes modules into separate layers and a module is only allowed to access modules in the layer directly below, which is in contrast to DAG, where modules can access all modules lower down in the hierarchy regardless of which layers they belong to. And the layered architecture are only useful in cases where we have a number of serial operations to perform since we go in from layer to layer and one of the most famous layer architecture in, in our area is the internet stack. So it could look like this. In layer 1 we have two modules which connect to the other modules in layer 2 which are only allowed to connect to modules in layer 3. So we are, we are not even allowed to connect to other modules in the same layer. We are only allowed to connect to modules in the layer below. And we separate all the modules into different layers. And of course, ideally, each layer should have a well-defined task. And choosing an architecture when developing a game is not a trivial task, especially if we want to design and develop the game engine as well as the game-specific code. Uh, and there's often the case that we have no perfect match for our specific game. Uh, and we can take a general architecture, a DAG architecture, but we might need to make some modifications to suit the game. And to work as an architect, which is a person responsible for designing a custom architecture for a system, you need years of experience as a developer. But the modular architecture with or without controlling dependencies is, however, almost, almost always a good starting point. We can start from there and build up on it and see where we end up. And we should try to avoid having too many loops in the dependencies. An essential thing when designing a game system architecture is the game controller. And in many traditional software systems, things happen only after clicking a button or clicking an option in a menu or similar. A click triggers a number of serial or parallel events and the user notices that something happened in the software. In games, a lot of things happen without any interaction from a user, which is slightly different from traditional software. AI entities decide what to do. We have AI controlled characters in the game. Entities change position in the game world based on the movement speed and direction even if we don't interact with them. Graphical objects are rendered, collisions are detected and handled, background music is being played and so on. And this is dealt with by a logic component commonly referred to as the game controller. It controls what's happening in the game when we are not interacting with anything. And it has some task sequence depend and it can be a bit different depending on the type of game. But from a general perspective, we initialize the game. We start the main game loop, initialize the front end, which could be a menu, and start the front end loop, which gather input, renders the GUI screen update the front-end state where we click at different options, trigger any state changes, etc. And when we start the game, the front-end shuts down and we initialize a level and go into the level game loop. The, the game loop gathers input from the player. It runs any AI code that controls the AI controlled entities, runs physics simulations, update game entities, states, positions, etc update the time step because the time is running in the game and update the game state if anything happens if we are finished with a level or if a player died or whatever happened and when the level is finished playing we shut down the level and when the game has ended we shut down the game so we're different steps which we need to do and we have a clear separation where we move from the front end menu system to 
initializing at the level and of course if we have more level we initialize them when we move to a new level. And the initialization and shutdown steps are quite crucial when it comes to performance. Uh, we need to correctly handle all the initialization, initialization and shutdown of the different systems used in the game and it's a very important task to do correctly. And the purpose of the initialization step is to load all resources needed for part of a game. For example, the front end or a specific level, we need to load all the graphic, graphical assets on the 3D objects, the sound effects, etc. And the purpose of a shutdown step is to unload all resources used in a part of a game to free up memory. So in the initialization step, we load resources into the memory. In shutdown, we unload them. And to minimize any dependency problems, a good approach is to unload resources in the exact reverse order as we load them. And we must also make sure that both the initialization and shutdown step goes quickly. It's extremely boring for a player to wait endlessly for a new level to load. Uh, most players think this is very, very boring and they are extremely impatient about loading times. And it could ruin an otherwise very good game. A good rule of thumb to follow in the initialization and shutdown is to use the resource acquisition is initialization or RAII philosophy. This means that when you create a game object, it is in itself responsible for loading all the necessary resources, textures, collision boxes, collision volumes, scripts, etc. that are needed for that game object. And when we destroy a game object, it is responsible for shutting down all the resources it is using. And the code should also handle all errors and exceptions that can occur and, and what we should do if, if any error occurred. So, an initialization example using the RAII principle, we create a player ship. So we create the player ship object in the game and it starts by loading a texture, which is the ship up here, the first one. And then it loads a mesh collider, which we're going to use for collision detection. And it loads shooting sound effect and the graphics used for loading the texture shot for the shots, laser shots texture, the sound effect, and last the controller script that controls the actual player ship. So in a sequential order, load texture, load mesh collider, load laser shots texture, load shooting sound effect, load controller script. And then we have initialized the player ship. If we want to shut down it, we do the same thing but we reverse the order. So one one is to unload the controller script, then unload shooting sound effect, laser shots texture, mesh collider, and the texture. So we unload it in the exact reverse order as we initialize it. And during the shutdown steps, the whole game world often needs to be unloaded. So we have a lot of things that needs to be unloaded. And the shutdown logic iterates for all entities in the game world and unloads all the resources used by the entities and each entity in turn free all the used resources. And this is very carefully controlled and also very slow operation. To get around this, we can dedicate a large block of memory. We talked about memory blocks in the previous lecture to the whole game world. And at shutdown, we just wipe the whole memory block, which is an extremely fast operation. We just say this whole block of memory, we don't need it anymore, so just wipe it. And many programming languages does not support such control over the main memory. We can do it in C++, we cannot do it in Java and C Sharp. But this is an approach that we can use if we can control how fast we need to shut down stuff. The main game loop is essential when you start playing the actual game. And it's one thing that you will come in contact with when you develop your own game. So a running game is driven by a game loop. And the game loop performs a series of tasks to keep the game world updated and alive. 
we have a player input if we control with a keyboard or mouse or a gamepad or whatever. We run any AI code to decide what computer controlled characters shall do. We run physics simulation, update all the game entities, position, states, etc. Render graphics and so on. And each iteration, each time we run this loop is called a frame or game frame. And games typically run at several frames per second, one, for example 30 frames per second, so 30 FPS. And we can usually see that in games which FPS a game is currently running at, and the faster hardware, the faster FPS it's possible to have a higher FPS. So in this case, all of the above tasks, the task we have here, uh, give a play input, etc., must be finished within one thirtieth of a section, which is less than 33.3 milliseconds. So tasks are not allowed to take longer than this, since it will cause the game to freeze for a short moment, usually called lag, so the game lags. It doesn't work as intended, it isn't as smooth as you want it to be. And tasks that take longer time to execute must be broken down into multiple steps and ex executed across several frames. Another option is to use multi-threading, but that can lead to other problems such as thread synchronization and deadlock issues. So multi-threaded programming is something that we should be careful with using if we are not very experienced in parallel programming. We also have a sense of time in the game. Frames need to be synchronized with a clock, so we know that we run at a certain frame rate. Otherwise, the game would run much faster on faster hardware. And of course, it would be problematic if we have a car racing game and uh, the car runs much faster on, on my computer and my opponent, which has a slower computer, and the car doesn't run as fast. So if a game is running in 30 frames per section, each frame must take 1 30th of a second and not less, and certainly not more. If it's less, we can wait. If it's more, we have a problem. So if it finishes in less time, we can halt the execution until the freight time has passed. If it takes more time, the game will start to lag. And to synchronize the time, we usually read the system clock at the start of each frame. So we know exactly when the frame should be started and we know how long the frame should take. So we read the clock, we execute the code in frame one, we wait some time and when we execute frame two, and it might take less time than frame one, so we wait a bit longer execute frame free, etc, etc, and ideally the time between one frame has ended and the next one should be zero milliseconds, so it should not be any wait time between. And we have a global time lounge, so we need to synchronize each frame to the system clock, so we know exactly when it takes, so all frames take one thirty for a second and not less and not more. And there are two ways of dealing with time in games. We can have a fixed frame duration. The game is always running at the same frames per second. Or we can have a variable frame duration where the game can change number of frames per second at runtime. Fixed frame duration is common on consoles where the hardware doesn't change and we know how fast it's possible to run the game. And variable frame rate is more common in PC games where players have a wide range of different hardware configurations uh, of different performance. Variable frame rate is more complex to deal with, but take advantage of faster hardware. The player interacts with the game through some input device. We can have a mouse, keyboard, gamepad, touchscreen, even cameras like Microsoft Kinect, etc. So we have different options of how to interact with the game. And the player input must be responsive enough so the player feel that he or she is in control over the game and not too fast, which make the game unplayable. So not too slow and not too fast. And we usually read player input at the beginning of each frame and use these readings in the rest of the frame. By doing this, reading the player input first in a frame minimizes lag, so we don't have any wait time when the game reacts to the actual inputs. 
And if we have online games, network messages must be read and handled by the game loop as well. But networking is out of the scope of this course, so we'll not discuss it any further. And the game world is a simulation of a real living world. Things happen in the world even without player input. So regardless of if a player has interacts using some input with a game, the game world must be updated and running. And we do this in the simulation tasks. And the simulation task includes a lot of subtasks. So we can run AI code. So the different computer controlled characters do what do something. They can move, shoot, or guard an area. We run scripts that update states or trigger events in the game run physics simulation to make sure that game objects move correctly in the game world and handle collisions, update effects such as particle systems mm -hmm. used for explosions or fire or waterfalls, run animations for different characters that have some have animations, update player position and animation based on the player input and update the camera position. So it's a lot of tasks that we need to do in the simulation step. And this step is quite time consuming and a lot of things for a lot of entities have to be done in this step. And for large game worlds, it might not be possible to run and simulate all parts of the game world. Instead, we can run simulation for the part of a game world that is visible for the player. So we only simulate what the player notices. For example, there is usually no need to run an expensive AI code for a guard that is in a building at the other end of a town and the player doesn't notice what the, car, what the guard will do anyway. So there's no need to run the code for it. Another optimization is to keep the entity that needs updating in a priority queue. So the simulation engine starts updating the entities with the highest priorities and continues until the frame time runs out and every time an entity is updated, its priority is lowered and is moved back in the queue. And the entities that were not updated will be updated in subsequent frames. But care must be taken to avoid a problem called starvation. And it means that an entity has so low priority that it's never updated, it's always in the back of a priority queue and is never updated. And that should, of course, be avoided. In the simulation step, entities are moved around in the game world. They have some speed and direction, and the player moves around, and we have obstacles, walls, trees, etc. And the game world is a simulation of a physical world, and in a physical world we can collide with things. And in the game world we also need to deal with collisions. And collision handling is done in two separate phases. Could detecting a collision and responding to a collision. And a collision detection is, is a quite costly step and we can take measures to improve performance of it. And we'll talk a bit about those steps in later. In the first collision detection step, for each entity we need to check if it is colliding with another entity. And by entity we mean anything in the game world, characters, an arrow, a bullet, a rock on the ground, or even the ground itself if we want to move up hills or etc. And as I said, it's, it's not a cheap operation. And the more complex an object is, the more expensive a collision check is. And if we have very complex characters we can, or models, we can speed collision detection up by using simplified collision volumes. For example, a collision check between two spheres is very fast, but a collision check between two human characters with a lot of triangles is quite slow. So we can have collision volumes instead of using the actual volume for the tree, uh, the palm tree, we can use a simplified, which almost covers the tree. Uh, the penguin has a quite detailed mesh so it takes some time to do collision checks with a penguin and the human have a slightly simplified but still quite complex collision volumes. 
And once we have detected a collision, it's time for a response step. And in the response step, we need to calculate how it affects each of the entities involved in the collision. And the collision response should follow the law of physics as used in the game, not necessarily the real physics, but we try to make the game as real as possible. We should apply quite realistic physics calculations. And the collision response is affected by a number of things. The speed and direction of movement of the entities involved. If we have gravity, the friction of the ground, the material the entities are made, up, made of, how bouncy there it is, the material, if it's uh, a rubber ball or if it's uh, a metal ball. And if involved entities are destructible, they can be destroyed, we must also handle damage. And after we have dealt with collisions, we apply additional updates to entities that was not dealt with in the simulation. For example, apply animations, update particle systems, similarly, or similar. So that's the last thing we do, any additional updates that are needed. And when we have simulated and update the game world, we need to display it on the screen, which is called the rendering phase. And the rendering is a complex and important task, and we will talk more about it in the fourth lecture in the course. And depending on the game, there might be more tasks that we need to handle in the game lo loop, mixing sound effects with background music, send batches of network packets, handle any additional network input, etc. So, if we want to structure a game loop, it could be something like this. While the game is not finished, while we are running, we update the time. That's the first thing we should do, synchronize with the global timeline. Get input from the player, get network messages, simulate the world, do the collision steps to handle collisions, update objects, render the world, and if we have anything else to do in the, in the end. And the drawback of this approach is that it's not very flexible. In one level, we might not need any network connection. And we have hard-coded the different steps in the game loop. So we can, a better approach is to make it less flexible or modular. So we can have a list of tasks that the game loop executes. So for each task, we update the tasks and tasks can be added depending on what we need to do in the current subsystem or current level or front end. We can add a new update time task, a new get input tasks or similar. So we only add the tasks that are needed for the specific level. And the game loop, as we have discussed so far, execute all operations serially. So we take one after another, first start with the time, and when time synchronization is finished, we get input, and after that we do simulation, etc. And ideally, we want rendering to show the actual game world on the screen to be very fast to avoid any visible lag. And we will also like the simulation to be as accurate as possible, which can be time consuming. And a common optimization is to run simulation at a fixed frame rate, for example, 20 frames per second. And we separate rendering and we can run the rendering with as high frame rate as possible. And that's why if you have a really fast hardware, games can run at maybe 100 or 120 frames per second. But the simulation and the logic of the game runs at the same frame rate as on your friend's computer, which might not be as fast. So by doing this, we've combined the simplicity of running simulation at a fixed frame rate and fast run rendering on high-end hardware. And a simple single threader approach for this would, would look like we do some stuff and if it's time to run the simulation, we can run the simulation every twentieth of a second. We run the simulation and on all frames we render the world. So we render the world as often as possible and we run the simulation when needed. So, and in theory we can use one thread for simulation and another thread for rendering, but synchronizing multiple threads can be tricky and prone to errors. So avoid it unless you are very experienced in multi-threaded parallel programming. 
A problem with this approach is that the same game world will be rendered multiple times since the simulation has not made any updates to the game world. The simulation doesn't run as fast as the rendering. And re rendering identical game worlds is a waste of resources and we will not gain anything from the coupling simulation and rendering. But to solve this we can interpolate the position and rotation values for entities based on the previous position and known velocity. So we know, even if we haven't simulated the game world, that this character is moving in a direction with some speed. So we can move that entity even if we haven't run a new simulation step. So entities will move around in the game world even if we haven't updated the simulation. And this often results in higher frame rates and smoother animation and better responsiveness of a game because the characters, they move smoothly at each rendering step instead of doing large steps every time a new simulation has executed. So if a decoupled game loop or interpolation can look like this. So we run the simulation when needed, we interpolate the state of the game objects all every time before rendering the game world. And in most cases we don't have to care about the order of execution of the different tasks in the game loop, but there are a few exceptions. Player input should be read first in a frame or very early in the frame. If we read them last, it would take one frame before the game reacts to player input and the game would not feel very responsive. And the same goes with network messages for online games. And even if we don't use multiple threads in the game loop, we do have a parallelism between the main CPU and the graphics card, the GPU, we need to think about. And also, as I mentioned before, time synchronization should be done very early in frame. The principle is quite simple when it comes to using the CPU, the main processor of a computer and the graphics GPU processor. The GPU, the GPU should not have to wait for a CPU to finish. We should give tasks to the graphics call, card while we are doing work on the CPU because they are parallel hardware devices and they can work at the same time. And in practice, optimizing the scheduling of parallel tasks is quite difficult. And the same applies to if we use many cores, we can have a modern hardware, we can use dual cores or free cores as efficiently as possible. That might be very difficult. But if we compare it, if we would use a strictly serialized option, first we do on the right figure, first the CPU finishes all its tasks and then the graphics GPU finishes all its tasks. On the left version we have parallelized it well, so first we the CPU starts by doing some stuff and send tasks to the graphics card and it can continue working in parallel with the CPU. And the total execution time is much less in the left side, in the left figure, where it's more parallelized. So that's what we should strive for, even if it can be difficult sometimes to make it work perfectly. We have talked a bit about game entities and we'll talk a bit more about, about what it actually is. Uh, we need a definition for a game entity and it could be seen as a self-contained piece of logical interactive content. It means anything in the game that moves, triggers an event, that the player can, can pick up, that animates, etc. So all the different objects in the game we can do something with or that the game loop does something with. A piece of clothing is not an entity if it's just a decoration of a player but it is an entity if a player can pick it up and equip it. The same goes with a sword etc. And it's up to the game developers to define the exact boundary of what a game entity is and what it's not. But a rule of thumb is if it moves it can trigger events if a player can interact with it, if it can animate, then it's a game entity. And an entity requires some amount of 
memory. It also has some cost of updating it, running animations, running AI code. And there's also a cost of traversing for all entities in a game world if we have very large game worlds. And traversing the list of entities and update each of them every frame can in some cases be a very costly operation. For smaller games it's not an issue and we can simply keep the entities in one list so we update all of them every frame. But for larger game worlds we need a smarter way of traversing and updating entities. So we need to organize entities. And how to organize them is largely, largely dependent on the type of game. But the goal of the organization is to use data structures to have, allow the game to do whatever operation it needs to do as efficiently as possible. And strategy games often use grids since the game world is usually a 2D plane, maybe with some different height levels, but it's, it's a 2D game. And first person games use some ways of dividing the game world into sub areas with for example a technique called BSP trees. So the whole idea of the organization is that we shall only update the entities mm -hmm. that are important for the player, that uh, the player notices. So if entities are in a sub area at the other side of the game world than the player is, we don't need to update them. So BSP trees looks like this. So we start with the game world in the left A. We have one area, the whole game world is the root of this tree. And then we divide it into two parts. So we have B and C, which is a sub part. And we continue dividing the sub part B into D and E. So we have divided it into two smaller. And when we continue with D, divide it into smaller. And we continue until we cannot find any more convex regions in the game. So di we divide the whole game into small convex regions. And entities, game objects, they are located as leaf nodes to subregions. So entity 1, 2 and 3 are located in region F. And then we know that we cannot see from region F, we cannot see the regions in the upper part of the map, so we don't have to care about the entities that are located in those regions. Starcraft or similar strategy games often use grids, and in Starcraft we have grids in different levels. So all the unit positions, they use 1x1 tiles, a walk tile is 1x1, which is used for pathfinding, for finding out how to move from one position to another in the game world. And the build tile is used to place buildings and they have 32 times 32 tiles. Uh, and the different objects, the different units, entities are positioned in different uh, grids, different positions in the grid that make up the game map. So when we are using, for example, BSP trees, we can update the entities of interest in each frame. We can simply skimp entities in, in nodes or tiles that are not visible for the player and that improves the overall performance of the games. And if updates are needed for non-visible entities, we can use a simplified update logic that, for example, does not run animations and rendering to improve performance. It only runs the logic, the AI code, so we know what the character is doing but we don't run any animation. It's a performance improvement just to avoid traversing all entities in a large linked list and updating them, since there will be constant cache misses if we do a traversal of a linked list. And by grouping entities in sub-areas, we only need to traverse a smaller set of entities. When we create new entities in the game world by spawning some objects, there are a few things we need to keep in mind. Each new entity must be assigned a unique ID number. That's a common way we design it. So all game entities have an ID number. That's a good way of designing it. If we use a component system, the correct components must be assigned to that entity. Uh, if we use an extensible object factory, an object factory, the correct ob class instance must be instantiated and returned. Meshes and textures must be loaded and other stuff that is needed, sound effects, 
So we initialize the actual object. And when loading and instantiating a level, we need to load all the assets, which are all the compo graphical components and scripts and models that are used in the level, and also set the state of a game world and all entities. So we are in default state, the default position where they are spawned in the level. And if we load a saved game, the stored state of each entity must be set and updated. If it is a new level, the default state for each entity is used. Where is this entity at the start of a new level? What weapons does it have equipped, for example? Uh, and the amount of health which weapons it has carried, which it can use and switch between, etc. So the level loader iterates for all entities in the level data file and calls the object factory to create the different entities. And the extensible object factory is an extension to the standard object factory, which we hasn't really covered. But you can read it up if you're interested in how it works. So, what if we have 200 orcs in a level? We have a large strategy game and our opponent has 200 orcs in his army. And some data is unique for each entity. For example, the position of each single orc and the current health of each single orc. But it's a serious waste of resources if we store the same 3D model and texture 200 times in the main memory. So we want to avoid it. So for each entity, we need to define which data fields are unique and which data fields can be shared among several entities. So we define the different or an orc. We have the unique ID. The green fields are unique. The unique ID defines a reference to each game entity and the entity name could be a shared data, it could be an orc, and the mesh name, the 3D model it uses, the animation it uses, the max hit points, and the script name are all shared. So we only need to store them once for all orcs. But the position and rotation and current hit points are unique and needs to be set for all, for each single orc of these 200 orcs. But the mesh name, we only need to store it once. So to create it in code, we usually have some form of team template. For example, an org template can be an abstract base class with a shared data fields and an instance of each entity with a unique data. So we have a pointer to the different template in the unique data and the template has all the shared data for an org, for example. So we can instantiate a number of orcs, orc 1, 2, 3, and 4 using the orc template. And we can instantiate an orc boss by using the orc shift and with a number template. And it's quite common that entities spawn new en entities that we fire something or drop something. And the spawned entities often need to know who the parent is. A tank can spawn missiles from your shooting, and with a missile hit and destroy the enemy units, the parent tank shall be awarded some experience points. And there are two ways we can deal with this in the code. We can have identification through reference. So each child has a reference to its parent object, so a missile has a re an entity reference to its parent. But that's a drawback of this approach. If a tank is destroyed before the missile hits, the missile tries to call an invalid object reference, and the game probably crashes or we get some error. The other approach, and the more safe approach, is that each child keeps the unique ID, the UID of its parent. And when a missile hits, it can check if the object with the unique ID exists or not, and if it exists, a reference to the parent object is given and the experience can be awarded. So we only store the unique ID. And the system needs a translation between the unique IDs and object references, for example, with a dictionary or if we step through a list until we find the correct object. 
And this is the most common approach due to its robustness. We avoid the problem of calling and having invalid references in the system. And for a player and other entities to be able to interact with the game world, we need some way of communicating between entities. And through the unique ideas, we can get a reference to another entity. But how do we tell the other entity what we want to pick it up? We have a sword, we want to pick it up. And direct metal calls method calls can be error prone to use since not all entities can be picked up and we need to type cast to the correct entity type. So we should avoid that. A better way if we use a component system we can check if the entity has a pickup component and call method methods on the component. So we don't care what the actual type of the entity but we know that each entity has a number of components and if we find a pickup component then we can pick up the object. It can however for some reason have several pickup components or we might change the meta interface for pickup components and this leads to the same problems using direct meta calls. So we should avoid that. We should look into each object and see do we have multiple pickup components, do we allow that and we should be careful to not change the interface of modules and components etc because that would cause some unforeseen error in our system. And the most robust system is to communicate with messages instead of calling methods in the components. So an entity A sends a pickup message to another entity B and if the entity B has a pickup component, it finds out that there is a pickup message sent to, to it and executes the pickup operations. And messages are usually stored in a container which we call a black box and at each update each entity checks the blackboard if there are any messages it needs to take care of. So we have a blackboard with a list of messages and the messages are assigned to the unique ID of an entity and the entity can check if it has messages and get the list of messages. And a message has some information in it which is used. We can see the sender and we can see the target and different the pickup message. We can do something if we receive a pickup message and we can also send some information in the message if we would like to. So that's a quite common approach to use to have a blackboard messages system in, the, in a game. The only drawback is that it can reduce performance because creating new class instances is not a fast operation and we constantly create and delete old messages which also fragment the memory. If we can manage the memory, fragmentation problem can be minimized if we use a specific memory pool for messages. We can do this in C++ but not in in C Sharp or Java. As with many choices or techniques to use, the benefits and drawbacks of different options have to be compared and evaluated. Is it really needed to have a quite complex blackboard message system or is, it, is there another approach which we can do just as well? Memory and file operations are also something we need to quickly discuss. Memory management not so much. If we use C++ we can improve performance a lot by using customized memory management. But in C Sharp and Java we have very little control over memory management and it's out of scope of this course. Uh, there is a book I can, uh, which you don't have to buy but there is a book I can send a link to uh, where I have some information about memory management. There are also some resources which you can Google up. Uh, so, and in German C Sharp, we don't need to think that much about memory management because we have a garbage collector. And there is one exception. Many languages have different implementations of garbage collector. For example, we have a GI one in Java, which usually has much better performance than the default garbage collector in Java. Uh, and some languages provide some control over garbage collector when we need to run it or not. And it's a good idea to learn about memory management in the programming language you plan to use for your game if you have 
a lot of stuff in your memory. Usually the game engine takes care of that for you. But when we instantiate a level, a lot of files need to be loaded. Textures, meshes, scripts, sound effects, animations. So we do a lot of file input and output operations, file I.O. And it's important that we optimize the load times as much as possible because players hate waiting for endless load times. If we develop for multiple platforms, we also want to have a unified interface for loading files instead of directly calling the platform methods for file handling. So we want a module with the same interface regardless of the operating system and we have different implementations depending on the platform we use. So we can do this by creating our own custom file system which is extremely common in in-game programming and other type of, of software which needs to be developed for multiple platforms. So a unified platform independent file system can look like this. So we have a file system uh, which has an interface op open file and if file exists and if we open the file we get a reference to the file and we can read and write and seek to a certain position in the file and the platform independent classes uses the platform dependent programming language platform classes for in this case the Java file for handling different file inputs and output streams and file handling. And we can make a similar implementation in C Sharp and depending on which platform we are developing for. And we also need some paths to the different files to load and storing the full part street file on the hard drive is a bad idea because if we use her decides to install the game in a different folder than we expected we might run into troubles because we have hard-coded the full paths. So we need to keep track of the installation path of our game and use relative paths from the installation path to each file. And this also saves some memory since the full path name can be quite long and we might have lots and lots of files to load. But that's a very small gain though. Consider the case where we create a new entity and we read data about health, points, position, weapons used, etc. from a file. If we use a very naive implementation, it could look like this. The file system has a method that returns the value for a specified parameter and internally the system works as follows. The it opens a file, seeks to the correct position for a parameter, reads the value and closes the file. And if we read a lot of data about a lot of entities, we have constant opening, seeking and closing of files which will be a huge bottleneck in the game and it will take endlessly long for levels to load. So that's a bad approach. A better way is to use buffering. We can read the contents of the whole file into the memory and we can then access data from the memory and when we are finished with a file we can delete the contents from our memory and read a new file. And buffering is easiest handled by using a buffer layer that uses regular file implementation. So we add a layer, layer called the buffered file where we read the contents of a, a whole file and the internal methods instead of directly reading to disk it looks up the data in the contents array used by the buffered file. So we don't have to open and close files in the operation system all the time. And we can also have a buffered layer that stores a part of a file instead of a whole file if we have very large files. And where data outside the current stored block is requested, we read a new block into the buffer. Uh, and that's a good approach if we have very large file, which we don't want to store in the memory, main memory because they are simply too large. So the only difference is that the buffered file have the contents have a size, the block size. So we read and fill the block and then we access data from a block and then we can switch out and read new blocks when needed. If we use the default file system of our hardware, we usually have no controls over where files are physically located on the disk. 
especially if we have a mechanical standard hard drive, it's faster if we have SSD. And in that case, a lot of time will therefore be spent for seeking the position of a requested file on the hard drive because it's spread out over different physical locations in the hard drive. So if we need to access 10,000 files for a level and seeking to age on average 10 milliseconds per file, a total of 10 seconds is used just for seeking, which we don't do anything. We just have to wait until we find the file we, we need. DVD and Blu-ray discs on consoles have much longer seeking times than traditional hard drives and 10 milliseconds per file is then probably an underestimation. Uh, so we want to avoid having large, long seeking times and many seeking times. And we can almost completely eliminate that by using what is called pack files. A pack file is a large file that contains other files. And it usually contains a header information with a list of all the files contains inside and where they are located. They are offset from the start of a pack file. So we know that if we want to read the second file, we jump to some offset and then we read the contents of the second files. And after the header follows the actual contents, the data of all files. And there are some benefits with pack files. We reduce the overhead needed for opening and closing files, which can be quite slow depending on uh, the operating system or what type of media the data file is stored on, because we only need to open and close the pack file once. And the file, it's a large file, so it's stored, stored in, large, in one large contiguous block on the hard drive, which reduces seek times. And we are also in control of which order files are stored in the pack file, and by optimizing the order, we can further reduce seek times. Since we know that we read file one, then read file two, we, we have, are completely in control of how they are stored. And there are several standardized formats for pack pack files, for example, cabinet used in Windows cab, we can use zip files, sedlib files, and most formats can also be used with or without compression. And without compression, we have larger files, but we don't need to decompress them, so it's faster reading them. So we need to decide whatever benefit of using compression or not. And the benefits of using a standardized format is that there are libraries we can use for reading the files and tools for creating the pack file. We can also use our own format, but if we do that, we need to implement an additional layer in the file system that can handle our own pack files. Sedlib is very common in games since it's a free format, so you often find that one. Game resources. We talked about game entities and we briefly mentioned game resources and assets. And all game resource, resources we have could be animations, textures, sound files, scripts, or what we called assets. And each entity has a number of assets attached to it. It could be an animation, it could be a texture, a 3D model, etc. And, as mentioned earlier, to reduce memory usage, assets are often shared between several entities. And the shared assets must be carefully managed to avoid problems. If we kill an orc and all its assets are removed, what happens if you have more orcs that use these assets? It will not look good. The game might crash or we might see a very weird 3D model instead of the nice looking orc we want. So we need some way of knowing when it's safe to delete an asset or not. And there are a number of different ways of doing this. When loading a level, all assets that are needed for the level are loaded. And when we unload the level, all assets are deleted. And this is the most simple approach, but does not allow any dynamic loading or deleting of assets during gameplay. We load everything and we unload everything at the same time. And this can be a limitation if we have limited memory resources. It also does not support keeping assets in memory between levels, which sometimes can improve loading times. So another slightly more complex way 
is re reference counting. So each time we create an entity, we increase a counter for each asset the entity uses by one. And each time we remove an entity, we decrease the counter for each asset it uses by one. And if a counter reaches zero during gameplay, no entity is using that asset and the asset is removed from the memory. If a counter happens to increase again, the asset is reloaded into the memory. And if we want to keep an asset in the memory for the whole level or between levels, we simply make sure the counter is one after the current level ends or that it never reaches zero. And care must be taken so we don't do any unnecessary delete and reload of the same asset during gameplay. For example, if we kill the last orc and we remove all assets about two seconds later a new orc is spawned and we need to reload them. So it was a waste of resources to unload and load the assets between, after killing the orc. So, to summarize this, today's lecture, games are complex pieces of software and the choice of architecture has a large influence on how flexible and dynamic the code structure is. The game loop is the heart of the game, since it's, it's run several times per second, we need to optimize its execution. Game resources assets take up a large part of the memory usage and reusing assets where possible is a good approach. Using pack files is a good approach to get more control over the file system and to improve loading times of new levels. So that's all for this lecture. Thanks for today. My name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck and this was the second lecture in the 1DV437 Introduction to Game Programming course. Thanks. <laughs>